Hi, I'm Brian. Welcome to Autogafool. We are here today just outside of Munich to bring you the pre-launch of the brand new T-Cross. What is it? Well, it's the brand new, slightly smaller brother of the already very popular T-Rock. Is it any good? Do you need one? Should you want one? Let's take a closer look and find out. regular viewers have commented to us before quite what the point of doing pre-release videos is. Well, one of my favorite comments that somebody said having watched the BMW X7 that we did is it's a little bit like a striptease. We know that the car is coming and it's nice to be able to show you a little bit more as we progress through and get more details on it. So this is our very first look at this car. It's pre-launch, pre-production, pre-everything. So we're not going to be able to show you everything today, but we are going to be able to bring you a lot of details about what this car will offer. Okay, so the first point to be made, VW have told us that they will be launching, I believe it's 12 SUVs within the period between 2016 and 2020. Five of those will be for the European market. Obviously, we already know the Tiguan. This will be the smallest of the bunch. This is based on the A0 MQB or um, transverse matrix platform. There we are. Now, if you're familiar with the T-Rock already, a lot of our viewers felt maybe that was based on the Polo. No, that's actually based on the A1 MQB platform. So this is very definitely the smallest of the bunch and it wants to be very distinctive as well. So there are lots of unique special features in this car that make it what it is. We're going to be showing you all of those. But let's take a start at the front for now. Well, it's obviously a little bit difficult to get a full sense of the visual aesthetic here because of the disguising that we have, but it's enough to give you a sense of the styling and the angularity. I want to start off by talking about these lights. Now, as this is fitted, these are the H7 halogens. You get whichever line you go with, full LEDs in the back, but if you want to get LEDs at the front, that's either an option or it comes with some of the higher packages. The only place you really know about that is in these running lights. Now in the halogen fitting, the running lights are built into the same housing as the fog lights. But if you go with the LED front lights, you will see a nice line of them running here right throughout the headlights. We can't show you that on this model, but it looks really good. We have seen it and it works really nicely. Coming slightly further across, this is where all of the sensors are placed. What's been really nice to see with the launch of this car is quite how many grown-up features there are available to have with it. I think the idea is just because it's a small car, it doesn't have to be little in terms of what it's offering and what's available. So you have a full suite of up to 11 different assistance systems that you can have fitted in this car, and that's where an awful lot of the technology sits. So this, you can already get a sense of right from first glance, is quite radically different to the way that the Polo presents on the road. Even though it's the same platform, it is definitely bigger and they want you to know about it. And the styling echoes that. Right throughout the Volkswagen SUV lineup, you see this angularity and also the powerful presence on the road. And in a small SUV, that's not an easy thing to achieve. Coming through to the side of the car, you see a couple more of those new SUV styling features. Let's start with the wheels down here. Well, these are 17 inch wheels. The wheels are actually available in 16 to 18 inches, and each one of those sizes comes with three different bespoke designs. If I come through slightly to the middle section here, you do get a sense of what one of the finished colors will be. There are going to be 12 different available with two bespoke ones. This isn't one of them. This is a fairly standard available orange, but we also have pale copper and a turquoise color specifically designed for this car. Even though it's based on the same platform, the entire length of this vehicle is four meters 12 or 13 foot six in length. And to give you some perspective, that's about three inches longer than the standard Polo. Now, to give you some distinction between its bigger brother, it's actually three inches shorter 
than its golf-based bigger brother. So there are some distinctions there. More on that when we get inside and you really can have a sense of how that space is being used. But for now, let's talk about this profile. Well, these rails, which here will be featured from the high line and up in terms of the line, they are chrome. If you go down, you get them in black color. And if you go with the base model, the trend line, there won't be roof rails at all. I think you can agree, you really do want them. It doesn't just add to the styling, but they're also very practically useful. Again, more in terms of what we're gonna use those rails for when we have a look at the interior. But for now, let's talk about how this styling works throughout the side. I'm pleased to see that that larger, more powerful styling has been carried through here, but not too aggressively. The way I've heard this car described is a city SUV, and I think that's perfect. What does that mean? It means you're not gonna be taking it off-road, or certainly not too industrially at any rate. But at the same time, it has a bit more of a beefed up styling in terms of what the car can offer. And I think that works really nicely here. Look at this ride height, it's great. It means you can well imagine Holding open these doors, I can't do that right now because we can't show you aspects of the interior, but they're just at the perfect height to allow easy access maybe for slightly older customers or for popping children in the back. I'm a big fan of that, it makes life a lot easier. And I think the styling matches that nicely. Coming through to the back, we can see how that extra space has been utilized here albeit through the camouflage for fitting in more load space in the rear. We're gonna take a look at that in just a moment. Overall, I would say that the presence of this car sits nicely on the road without being too overwhelming. As the smallest SUV of the family, it has to look like an SUV, but it really shouldn't look as if it's trying to pretend to be something that it's not. And for what it's worth, I think they've done a pretty good job. Coming around to the rear now, obviously it's a little bit difficult to show you the styling with all this camouflage in place, but we can tell you about it. We have seen it without the camouflaging. We're just not quite yet allowed to show it to you but let me start off with these rear lights. Well, these are brand new for this car, so they look very distinctive from what's gone before, but I can tell you that we have a C-like, very distinctive design on the rear lights, and it looks nice. It's in keeping with the rest of the style of the car. It's not too much. It certainly does look a little bit more rugged than you might expect from, say, a Polo, but not too overblown that you're gonna find it off-putting to sit behind one of these things on the road. We also have two very nice, and they are completely covered here, distinct rear lights that really adds to the overall visibility of that car and sits it nicely on the road. Coming back through, we have an LED strip that goes right across the back here. That's completely covered, we can't see it, but it fits in nicely with these lights. And again, on all lines, that's all LED. Now, let's take a look and see what they've done with the space in the rear. We are slightly limited in terms of what we can show you, but we can still give you a pretty good idea. What you're looking at right there is 385 liters of load space. But thanks to an extremely clever sliding rear seat, which we'll show you in a little bit, we can extend that with the seat still in their upright position to 455 liters. Now, look slightly higher up. You see this parcel shelf? Every now and then, you're gonna to wanna to get rid of that. Again, we can't show you this is pre-production, but I can tell you there is a space designed for it to go in just underneath this parcel shelf. And that's a nice touch because it means that you can have a completely empty back without that age old question, what on earth am I supposed to do with this? Let's take a quick look at that seat in the back. Well, again, because we're pre-production here, we can't show you too many details. And even if we did, it possibly wouldn't be the most pointful thing we could do because a lot of these things might change. But one thing that definitely will not be changing is this. This is the functionality of the rear bench. And as you can see, that is how I gain all my extra load space in the rear. It's really quite impressive to look at. Now, Michelle's helping me out there by showing me the way that we can fold these seats down. So we have an almost flat entry surface here. In a little bit, we will show you the optional uh, fold flat front seat. They told us this is so you can fit a surfboard in. They said they had people come and look from Portugal and it made perfect sense to them. Well, I'm from England. I don't think I've even seen a surfboard, much less needed to fit one inside a polo, but I'm happy with the idea that I could if I wanted to. Meanwhile, I really like the flexibility of these seats. You're starting to see this more and more on various different cars, that we have this sliding rear bench capacity, and it's so useful. I'm five foot 10 or 178 centimeters in height. As you can see from here, I have plenty of headspace back here. That's thanks to this larger SUV shape and 
I think Michelle can probably show you, I have more leg room than anyone could ever reasonably need. Now I have short legs, this car is set for me to drive, but if Michelle pans across to here, then you can see that there is more than adequate for standardly heighted people as well. Now, the finish of the plastic isn't done, so we're not actually going to show you the picture, but I can tell you a nice inclusion for this car is two charge points, USB charge points back here for your receipt passengers. They're going to like that too. We are not all done at 455 litres in the back. Here we have the optional, he said if he can find the lever, we have the optional fold flat front seat. And that takes us up to 1,281 litres of potential load space. That is an awful lot of room. And thanks to these seats being completely flat, if you do own a surfboard, you should be able to get it in. If it's too big for that, don't worry. We have rails up on top and you can pop it up there. At this point, we'd usually bring you the interior. Now, obviously we can't do that because it's pre-production, but that doesn't stop me telling you about it. Let's start with the seating position. Well, as you would expect, I have a very nice overview on the road. The seat's very comfortable. I'm five foot 10, 178 centimeters in height. And as you can see, I have ample head height in this car. Now, there are five different style lines you can have from this car, starting at the bottom at the trend line and moving all the way up to the top at the R line. That does dictate what you get in terms of additional packages and styling for the car. The best way I can describe it for somebody who hasn't seen this car before would be to say if you know about the styling from the up, where there's a lot of matching of interior materials to the outside styling, there's a little bit of that happening in here, but it looks a little bit more sophisticated and grown up. So still fun, but not too young. So it shouldn't put you off buying if you like things a little bit more conservative as I do. New for this car, we have an 8.3 inch fully digital cockpit. We have available 11 different assistance systems you can get on this car. What it comes with obviously is dependent on the line you go with, but everything is available as an option. So if you don't have it, you will be able to get it. Generally, they want to make sure that as much of the functionality that you expect from the higher up models is available down here as well. And what that all amounts to is a very comfortable experience once you're in the cockpit. Now, it doesn't come as standard, but you can also get a Beats sound system that's 300 watts and it comes with a subwoofer in the back. Why not do it? If you want to have the experience of a little bit more fun, we'll hopefully be able to tell you at the drive event how much that's going to cost you as an extra feature. But we've tried that from the other lineups and it's a very nice system. So hopefully that's enough information. Sorry, we can't bring you the visual, but we will do soon. In the meantime, I don't know, Michelle, I think it's time to find out how this diesel drives. What do you think? So let's have a talk about what's powering this thing. I say talk about, we'd love to show you what's under this bonnet, but this car is so pre-production that even the engine bay hasn't been finished off quite yet. So we tried, but don't worry, we do have all the details that you need. At launch, this is going to be available with three petrols or one diesel engine. The petrols range in size from 1 to 1.5 litres, producing between 95 and 150 horsepower. The diesel is a 1.6 TDI, that's what we have here, and that produces 95 horsepower. So, how does the T-Cross drive? Well, as you'd expect, it's a very much more upright experience than the Polo. We are 18.4 centimeters in terms of ride height or seven inches. And that's a whole 1.5 inches or just shy of four centimeters higher than the Polo. What that all adds up to is that I feel much more upright and I have much better all round visibility. Now it's not only that ride height number that's changed, this car is bigger in almost every dimension than the Polo. So that means more space right the way around. It also means a slightly longer wheelbase and that gives you an added area of stability on the road to make the most of that additional height. Ride itself is very pleasing indeed. We're driving the 95 horsepower diesel 1.6 liter TDI engine. And that means that we have all of the power and oomph that we need to make the most of this car okay it's not supposed to be a sports car it doesn't have the most powerful dynamic drive but if you want to give it a little bit more pep it does have four adjustable drive modes what you can change about those modes is different depending on which model that you go for well if you push the information button on the top of the display it will tell you which of the car's setups you are allowed to adjust with each of those modes 
but most of the time I think you're going to be more than comfortable driving around in normal which is as we have the car right now clearly that's the best setup between economy and drive performance it's perfectly comfortable and it feels right for the car when I put my foot down I've got more than enough pickup to make me happy and I still have as much efficiency as I want don't have those numbers to give you quite yet but don't worry we'll get to them soon now, I mentioned the infotainment system. I do think it's worth mentioning that we have a 10 inch driver's digital cockpit now. And what that gives us is the ability to change the information that we display while we're driving. An example of that would be the navigation. At the moment, I have it displayed on the central console, but I can move that map over so it comes right into the middle of my display. The only thing you can't do is have that information displayed on both the central console and the driver's display at the same time. But I don't think that's such a big of a deal. I can manipulate it so it looks exactly the way I want. I can either select between having a full screen map or I can place digital versions of those much loved analog dials either side of the information in the middle. My taste, I like to keep that map central, not least because if Michelle wants to tell me where I'm going wrong, he can use that as an easy reference point. I still can have my traditional navigation display in the middle of my analog dials, which simply tells me when I need to turn left, right, or carry straight on. The infotainment system has been nicely factored into this car, and I have very good steering wheel controls, so I'm able to adjust exactly what I want to adjust to give me the display that I really want while I'm driving. For me, less is always more. I want my attention to be on the road, and with that increased ride height, I have more than sufficient opportunity to make sure my attention is where it should be. There are many features about this car which we knew previously from higher up model lines, not least there are an optional 11 different assistance systems that you can have this car coming with. Now, they're all gonna be things that you're used to from other cars. What's impressive is that we're now starting to see all of these systems come through on the lower down models. I'm particularly enjoying the way that the adaptive cruise control works on this car. And don't forget, this is pre-production. So anything that I like on this car can only get better as we get closer to that production date. Production date, by the way, we should be able to get this car on the market within about a year. So this really is a very early opportunity to have a look at this car and how it works. Let's talk a little bit about the driving comfort. Well, the seats change with each one of the five styling lines that you want to go with. This car notionally is the Highline fit, and that means that we have the Highline seats. They're extremely comfortable. They're not too grippy, not too sporty, but they allow us more than enough comfort to go off and have a drive. Now that, I don't know if you picked it up on the microphone, was the automatic stop start of the engine and that works really nicely too. It is worth mentioning, that's one of the areas in which you think, hmm, I would like to see the final finish tuned application of this. Start stop always takes, in my experience, the most refinement to get it just right for the engines. Really, I couldn't say enough positive things about how this car feels to drive in terms of my expectation. It's always a concern when you take a smaller car and you make it higher, you elevate it to the road space of an SUV because you risk too much body roll as you go around corners, you risk a performance being somewhat compromised by a car or a platform doing what it doesn't natively want to do. Well, that hasn't happened here, and that's in large part because of the expansion of all of those dimensions. They've all been worked proportionally. So the drive experience of this car actually is remarkably similar to that of a Polo. You're just higher up, you have more space, and better all-round visibility. And what could possibly be wrong about that? So that about does it from us from our very, very early look at the brand new T-Cross. What do we think? Well, it's bigger in almost every respect. So I'm pretty sure that's gonna mean pricing as well. Now, sadly, we don't have any actual numbers to be able to give you today, but I'm sensing that it probably will just be a couple of thousand on everywhere else from what you're already expecting from the Polo. What are you getting for that? Well, there's no argument at all. If you're looking for a round town, small SUV, you're going to like this experience. It's more upright, there's better all-round visibility, vehicle access and exit is much easier with this increased seating position, and that's great if you struggle to get in and out of cars, or you're a little bit older, or you regularly need to transport lots of stuff. 
There's huge amounts of flexibility here. That 15 centimetre slide on that rear bench is superb. I think we're going to start seeing that on a lot more cars in future. It just gives you that extra little bit of flexibility so you can actually fit things that you want to right in the back. Well, I'm pleased to see all of the newer technology coming down from the top models also into this car too. Because this is a pre-production model, there are some things we would have been able to like to have shown you but haven't been able to. The engine could use a little bit more refinement, but they are still working on that. So we're not going to make any definitive comment yet, except to say that so far it's very pleasant to drive, especially once you get this car into around town settings. It's just great. You feel comfortable, you feel secure, and you feel that you're in complete control of your entire environment. So really, the question that we started off with is, what is this and do you need one? I think that's really going to be up to you in terms of what you use your car for. But if I lived in a city, I would feel a little bit overwhelmed with all those high sided vehicles coming in close. And the extra height really does help to make you feel that much more secure on the road. It's fun to drive. It's very comfortable. It's very flexible and very useful. So for me, it really is going to come down rather a lot to what we see in terms of pricing. But assuming that's kept in line, I think it's a really great addition to the SUV lineup. And we can only be more excited by what's still to come. Please don't forget if there are any comments or questions, and yes, of course, there are going to be lots of comments that we didn't sadly manage to get to with this because it's such an early version. But if there's anything that you want to know, please pop it in the comments below. Please subscribe, and we hope we'll see you again soon.